Books, please, this morning, and let's turn to page 327. We ask you to stand and join the choir as we sing Higher Ground, number 327. Shall we stand and sing together?
go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Paul Trauber is coming to pray for us this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this, the beginning of another new year. Father, we're grateful that we're allowed to start in your house. Father, we just ask you to bless the service today, Lord. Bless the message and the messenger. Father, if there's one lost soul here, that soul will be saved. Father, we just thank you for higher ground, Lord, because there's just many times that, Lord, we need it. Father, we just again ask you to bless the service today, Lord. Bless the many that are sick and afflicted in the community. Bless the families, Lord. Bring them comfort at this time. Father, we just want to say that we love you. For in your son's name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing for us at this time.
song books again this morning. Let's turn to page 150 and stand and sing with the choir. My, uh, let's see, let me look, let's see what it is. My faith has found a resting place. That's it. Okay, 150. Let's stand and sing together. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever living one, his wound for me shall clean. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. time. Shake hands with those around you. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. very grateful that you're at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church this first Sunday of the new year. Thank you for being here. You can do us a favor, please, if you would. If you're visiting today for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, I want you to fill out a visitor's card, please, if you would. You can fill the visitor's card out. Uh, keep the ink pen. Put the part you filled out in the offering plate. We also have a little gift we want to give you to share with you that you'll enjoy after the services are over. Our ushers are going to stand up here toward the front. You can raise your hand if you're visiting today for the first time or first time in a long time. How about visiting? Raise your hand for us, please, if you would. We see some folks here. Just move back to our area. Some folks on the left over here. Terry, right to your left, Terry. Okay. All right. See a young man in from the military here. Good. All right. If you'll do that for us, please, I'd appreciate that. Just fill the visitor's card out and drop it in the offering plate when it's passed here in just a moment. Anyone else? Keep them up just for a moment. We'll be there. You need some help over there? We have everything we need. Everything's okay. Need some help here, Terry? Joe, instead of eating those cakes, pass them out, if you don't mind. First year. First Sunday of the year. I've got to get on them, don't I? Man, they can't do anything. They're doing a good job. 
All right, ushers, if you'll come. Brother Mike, come here and pray for us this morning. Ask God to bless the offering. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this honor and privilege of worshiping you in your home. Father, as the sun you created lights our day, so do you light our life. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter number 26. Glory is going to come and sing for us. Time 
saw him spat upon, rejected and mourned. Still he grew the tree he knew would be used to make the old rugged cross. Nothing took his life, with love he gladly gave it. He was crucified on a tree that he created with great love for man. God stayed with his plan and he grew the tree so that we might go free. the tree he knew would be used to make the old rugged cross This is Family Month, as every January is that we had here these few years. I've been a few years. I've been your pastor, a long time. I've been your pastor, and this morning I've asked a family to share their testimony with us, a new family to us. But many of you know them already. I've asked Daryl and Kathy Robinson, our principal at our school, and I've tried to choose some folks that's probably gone through some times that can encourage your hearts about what they've gone through. And I want you to come, Daryl and Kathy, and give us a word of testimony this morning. I'm nervous, so pray for me. Um, speak up. Speak up? Okay. <laughs> well, I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a pastor, so from the time I can remember, we were taught to look to Jesus for everything. But it wasn't until I was in the fourth grade that I knelt down at a church, at Leesboro Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I asked the Lord to save me. And I'll be honest, there's been times where it's gotten rough, but God forgives, and you can go right back and get that joy of your salvation right back. He's been good to me. He's blessed me with a Christian husband, a family, and I'm glad my older two are saved. We're praying for our younger one. And then it's, you know, it's good to have Christian parents and it's good to have a Christian home. But if you don't have a church family, I don't know where people turn. Amen. You know, we've had, it's been rough. It's been some hard times, even with this. <laughs> and y'all have said kind words. You've done things that have just encouraged us. You'll never know till you get to heaven. And we appreciate you. I have caller ID at the house. Every time I see the pastor's number come up, I get this cold chill at my back. I figure he's setting me up to repay me for the joke that I pulled on him. But we appreciate the opportunity to give our testimony. I thank the Lord for the time when I was 15 years old when I realized that I was a sinner. I was born and raised in a Christian family. I'm the youngest of five children. And I was born the year that my dad went to seminary when God called him to preach. So raised in a pastor's home along with my wife. And I knew what I was supposed to do. I had heard the gospel growing up. And I think I made a profession of faith at an early age only because I knew that's what you were supposed to do. I had a head knowledge, but I didn't have a heart knowledge until I was 15 years old. And I realized that I was a sinner in need of saving. And I went and asked the Lord Jesus to save me at Bible camp again when I was 15 years old. And then several years after that, when I was uh, 20 years old, uh, I surrendered my life to full-time Christian service. Whatever God would have me to do, that's what I wanted to do. And I thank the Lord for the Christian home that he brought me up in. Uh, my wife and I, this year, will celebrate 13 years of marriage together. And 
I can look back at all the hard times that we've gone through, and, and I know there's a lot of folks that would just throw in the towel and give up, but I think because of our strong Christian homes that we were both raised in, we knew that the only option that we had was to trust the Lord, stick together, and keep on keeping on for Him. And I thank the Lord for the Christian home He's given us. I also thank the Lord, as my wife mentioned, for the Christian church, our church family that He's given us here. It has been very difficult, to say the least, the last month for us, and, and you folks have just opened your arms and encouraged us, as my wife said, and, and prayed for us. It's interesting, we've gone through some difficult times, it seems like every time I go to the, somewhere for the first time. When I went to college for the first time, that first week, I had an emergency appendectomy and uh, missed the first full week of classes, and that's how I met my wife, because we had the same last name, and uh, when I missed my classes, they would ask her, is, is he related to you? And she wanted to meet me, so she said yes, you know, uh, that deceitful woman, you know. <laughs> and, that, and that's how we met. And, and boy, if my other leg's broken tonight, you'll know why. <laughs> and then starting out here, the first month went just fantastic, loving, loving the, the church and the school. And then... then uh, than having the broke leg there uh, four weeks ago this past Friday. And, you know, you, can, you could get discouraged very easily, but you know God has a purpose for it, and God's, God's in control, and we just trust Him and thank Him for working in our lives and continuing to do so to this day. I appreciate the Robinson family. I really do. Matthew chapter number 26, please. I was hoping that one of them would tell you how they met. I thought that was so good. If I was Daryl, every place I moved, something happened to me, I wouldn't move for a while, would you? I'd take a hint somewhere. I'd, I'd keep the same woman and everything, wouldn't you? My goodness. <laughs> take a chance on that. <laughs> Matthew 26. Stand with me, please. <clears throat> I would eat and trade cars, amen? <laughs> if my pastor wanted to resign, I wouldn't let him, too. Let me say that, too. I better start. I'm never going to finish. Matthew 26, 1. And it came to pass. <clears throat> That'd be a good thing if you'd remember this coming year. When Jesus had finished all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Look at verse number 32 with me. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Father, make us a help and a blessing. Speak to us. Help us to speak to others. Make us a channel of help and conviction as well and comfort when needed. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. In the final three chapters of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 27, and Matthew 28 is the greatest event ever recorded in history. The greatest event in history was not when our astronaut walked on the moon. The event I am talking about is much higher than that. The winning of World War I and World War II, those great moments of American history and the Korean War and Vietnam War, fighting in it, our men returning. And I appreciate those men who fought that battle. And the Gulf War, the winning of it, was not the greatest victories ever won. The greatest victory ever won was won by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The greatest event in history was not a sporting event where some underdog beat someone much better than they are. Though at the event of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, prior to it, there was games played called the Game of the Kings. The greatest event in history was not what we just celebrated, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest it was, it's not the greatest. The greatest event is found in verse number 2. He's going to be crucified. And in verse number 32, he shall rise again and go before us. The event foretold, this event, 
death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was foretold before the foundation of the world. Before God ever laid the foundation of the world, I want to tell you something ought to shake you up and amaze you is that the Son of God loved you and cared for you. Before you ever got here, as a mother loves a baby in its womb, such is God's love toward you. It was the event which angels desired to look into, but was not able to do so. It was an event that prophets foretold time and time again about his coming, his dying, his living again. It's the event that every lamb ever offered by the Jewish people in Passover, on days of dedication, on feast days. They pointed to this day with the greatest moment of history. And recorded for us in chapter 26, 27, 28, the book of Matthew, is what individuals did with the greatest moment of history. And I want to tell you that you and I live in a great moment of history. The very fact that you have life this morning is vital, is it not? And the very fact that you're alive this morning only testifies to this fact, this is a great time for you and I. Because it's the amount of allotted time that God chose to give you in the course of human history that God has placed you here, not by accident, but by reason, God has you here and for a certain purpose. And my question this morning to you is this, on this first Sunday of 1998, is what will you do with the opportunity God has given you? I'm going to show you what these people did with this greatest event of history, what they did with it, and that will make it pertinent to where you live, see what you're going to do with what God has given you. The first thing we're going to see that jumps at us automatically that they did is the leaders try to take the opportunity to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would with me, please look in verse 3 of Matthew 26. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety by trickery and do what to him? And kill him. So this generation, these people here, these priests, these uh, scribes, this people here in this place made up their mind that the opportunity they had for the greatest event of history is they were going to try to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I know what you're saying. Preacher, we live in the 20th century. We're more civilized. We're more cultivated. We have more culture than that generation had then. Oh boy, if we could only draw the parallel, you'll see that all of us are sitting on the same ground this morning for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we have religious freedom, do we? Against the law to read Bibles in schools, some, some, most places. Against the law for a teacher to pray publicly in a public school. Against the law in many states to spank your children. Do it anyway. I tell you, and I say this with all my heart and sincerity this morning, that the God of this Bible, for the most part, is unknown by the generation you and I live in. We've been so duped into thinking that God is only a God of love that no one ever preaches about, or not many people preach about or talk about, the fact is that God is holy and that God will judge sin. Oh, I tell you what, this morning, we've got people that would love to destroy the part of God that's holy. Just love. Doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't matter what you do. Accept everything. Accept all that. But I tell you this morning, and I tell you with the conviction of my soul, that the God we serve not only is a God of love, He's a God of holiness. And God will judge the sins of America. And God will judge the sin of this nation. And God will judge our sins as well. Oh, <laughs> destroy that part of God. I don't want to hear that. I didn't come the first Sunday morning to hear that. Whether you came or not, the truth remains the same. God is holy. Amen. The second thing. The opportunity came the way not only to these scribes that were gathered there and the chief priest in chapter number, or verse number three and the elders of the people and the high priest. The opportunity came also to a young woman named Mary. Let's see what she would do with her opportunity of this greatest event in history. Chapter 26 of Matthew, verse number six. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, 
There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he set it meat. Now we happen to know from reading other portions of the Bible, this is Mary of Bethany. This is the sister of Lazarus that you read about in the Bible who Jesus resurrected from the dead. And what she did was the greatest event in history. She took an opportunity to show her love and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ. She, showed her, she took the time that God invested in her to be written in holy writ to show compassion and to show love and a sacrificial giving upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, every one of us here that know the Lord Jesus Christ in truth and sincerity are to spend our lives of showing our affection and our love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Therefore, I are to speak with him of compassion, are to live for him with devotion, are to talk with him with respect, witness for him with urgency, give to him with sacrifice, love him with faithfulness, serve him with diligence, because I have only one life to will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. You know, so many times in life, and I've been singing this song for the last two weeks. I can't think of all the words to it, so I'll probably get messed up this morning on it. But all the last two weeks, I mean, I don't know, I'll just start singing this song. And it talks about too many miles behind me. Too many rivers my feet have crossed, crossed through. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. And I want to tell you, there's too much to gain to lose. So we just need to keep on serving him, showing our love and affection and devotion to him who loves us and who cares for us. I've got to hurry because there's many here in this passage of Scripture. Number one, the religious people said they tried to destroy him. Secondly, Mary took the opportunity. Her name's not here, but it is another passage of Scripture. She took the opportunity to show her love and affection. The third one in this story is Peter. We're going to look at him for a few minutes. You know what Peter did? Peter missed the opportunity that was given to him. He totally missed it. Look in verse chapter 26. Look at verse number 32. Chapter 26, verse number 32. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he lets them know he's going, to be, he's going to be slain. But he also lets them know in verse number 32, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, This night before the cock crow, thou shalt die by me thrice. Peter said to him, Though all should die with thee, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, the other disciples said the same thing. Here's what Peter's problem was. He, because he missed the opportunity. Listen to me now. He was talking when he should have been listening. He was bragging about what he was going to do. He said, depending upon God to give him grace to do what he needed to do. Oh, Lord, not me. No, sir, Lord. Anybody but me now. And what if it means me dying for you, I'll never deny you. I'll never forsake thee. He was running off of the mouth when he should have been quiet. And he missed the opportunity. Now, nobody in here has that problem. But if you do, think about it, all right? The second thing. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. If I read you the story on in Matthew chapter 26 here, and we come to verse number 36, we see these words where it says in Matthew 26, 36, it says, Then cometh Jesus unto him into a place called Gethsemane, and saith to the disciples, Sit ye here while I go yonder and pray yonder. And he tells his disciples, you, Why don't you watch with me for an hour if you read that? And Jesus goes about a stone cast away neath those all out of trees, and he begins to pray. And he prays, and he comes back, and he finds the disciples sleeping. He goes again, he wakes them up, says, couldn't you watch one hour? And he goes back and he prays again the same prayer, and he comes back and they're sleeping. Couldn't you watch one hour? And he goes the third hour time and he prays and he finds them sleeping. And what Peter was doing is he was sleeping when he should have been praying. He missed fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ that would have given him strength to have stood the test he was facing. He missed getting the strength he needed to face the enemy. And I am convinced, I said this in Sunday school class this morning, I'll say it again this morning, and I'll say it many times this year to come, if God gives me grace and strength and the ability to do so, that one of the greatest sins that you and I face as Christians is the sin of prayerlessness. We just don't pray, folks. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. My Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul is often found relief. And often escape the tempter's snare by thy return. Sweet hour of prayer. Listen to me. 
We live in the days of the greatest opportunity that Mount Pisgah Baptist Church has ever had. We have the open doors of preaching the gospel to almost everywhere in the world this hour. And if we don't pray and take advantage of that, God forbid, God help us, God have mercy on us. We need to be a people. And I call you and I call this church to make this year one of the greatest years of prayers we've ever had in the history of this church. We need to pray and get a hold of God. We won't accomplish anything without God's help. We'll accomplish the thing. Last night, we were at home and my wife and I was discussing something and she has about three or four radios and they're always on. And we were discussing something and we are discussing something that uh, was a little perplexing and a little troubling to us. It was something we need to pray about. And I just had uttered the words to my wife that we need to pray about that and I need some help with that. And on the station we listened to, BBN started to sing, I must tell Jesus. Boy, I want to tell you, that blessed my heart. I stood there and I wept and I just listened to that song, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus will help me. Jesus alone. Not only did he miss the opportunity because he was talking when he should have been listening, he was uh, 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 sleeping when he should have been praying. The third thing is, is he was fighting when he should have been surrendering. They came to arrest Jesus in the garden and had he been listening to the Savior's prayer of not my will will thine be done, he'd had no problem. But what he did when they came to arrest him, they, he pulled out a sword and he cut one of the servant's ears off. He wasn't listening. He was, he was a time in his life, he was, he wanted to, this time he wanted to fight, but he wouldn't surrender. And many times God is trying to get our attention in our life for us to quit fighting him and surrender some of our life to him. Some of you have things in your life you never surrendered to him. You never surrendered your temper to him. You say, well, I just can't. I belong. You can control it if you want to. Now, you know you can, can't you? C come on. Am I going to prove that you can? I know you can. Get mad at your wife, right? Quick as the phone rings, hello. Can I, somebody say amen so I can go on? I never will forget one time I told this story a thousand times. This will make a thousand and one. I was out visiting one day, knocking on the door, and right before, when I walked on the porch, this lady was cussing her dog a blue streak. I mean, she called that dog everything a sailor could say. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> for, forgive me for that, dear brother. <laughs> everything a Marine could say. Any Marines in here? No, there's nobody in here. Okay. <laughs> Boy, she was giving, him a, giving that dog a fit. She was talking to that dog like you wouldn't talk to nobody. I knocked on the door and she came and she said, well, Reverend Walls, it's so good to see you. You know what I wanted to say? I wish I'd have said it. I'd give anything in the world. I said, I thought about it and said, I said, I bet your dog glad to see me too. <laughs> huh? But you fight instead of surrender. You've been fighting your, your lust. God wants somebody to be a preacher. Somebody wants you to witness to people on the job. Somebody wants you to be a missionary. Something in your life. God wants you to surrender. But you're going to miss the opportunity of serving God in the greatest days that, that was ever been in the history is because you won't surrender. You won't say yes to God about things in your life. So you'll be doing something for God, but you just won't surrender. You know the fight against it. That's how Peter missed his opportunity. He missed his opportunity because he was boasting when he should have been listening. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. He was fighting when he should have been surrendering. And fourthly, he was following when he should have been fleeing. The Bible says that Peter followed afar off. And he began to stand next to the devil's fire and he warmed himself. And I want to tell you, when you get listen to, close to the devil's fire and listen to the devil's talk, you're going to end up doing what the devil would do. That's why some of you run with the wrong crowd, you are leaving behind this year. You are leaving the doubters behind this year. You are leaving those folks that caught drown and cause you to be pulled down in your Christian walk with God. You are to flee them. There's some things you flee from. Uh, God said, flee youthful lust. There's some things you don't fight, you flee. And you run from those things that hinder you and keep you being what you are to be. Instead of just standing there and, 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 and following, you need to learn to flee. Wrong influences. Flee so you miss opportunities. How many times could I tell you of young people that tell me that they got in trouble? And now you can't blame this on, on you can't blame this on everything they do, but I got in trouble because I got mixed up with the wrong crowd. You flee that crowd. 
Don't you go after them. Consent thou not when sinners entice thee. Consent thou not. Proverbs 1.10. Well, here's what happened. Greatest opportunity event of history. Some sought to destroy him. Martha, or Mary, showed her devotion and love. Uh, Peter missed the opportunity that was before him. The fourth thing is Judas used the opportunity to be a deceiver. Look in chapter 26, verse number 23. They're at the Lord's Supper and they're having the last Passover. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And all of them said, Lord, is it I? And he answered, he said, he that dippeth his hand in Matthew 26, 23, he that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it were written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had never, not, had not been born. It been better for him to have faced the abortions in the womb, to grow up having seen all that Christ did and not be saved. Listen to me now. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Look at verse 47 with me. While he yet spake, he's after he's prayed in the garden, his third prayer. Lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him with a great multitude and swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same shall be is he. Behold him fast. Forthwith he came and to Jesus and he said, Hell, Master, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, What do you say? God's why he called him friend. But Judas took the opportunity to be a deceiver. Judas never one time in his life, having seen everything Jesus did, ever called Jesus Christ Lord. You never find him in the Bible. He never let him be the Lord of his life. Now, I'm not talking about lordship salvation. But I want to tell you something. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You see, you know why the only reason G Judas was there? Well, he could get out of it. He had the money. He never spoke of Christ in a harmful way to others, but he never spoke of him in an honoring way in his own life. You know what Judas thought? Listen, here's what Judas thought. He thought everything given to the Lord was wasted. Because if you read the other accounts where this woman anointed the feet of Jesus, anointed Jesus in another place, he said that money could have sold and been given to the poor. Anything given to Jesus Christ, he says, is wasted. I want to tell you what you give to Jesus Christ is not wasted. But it tells you something that's wrong in your life when you think that Sunday mornings are wasted when you give them to Jesus Christ. When you think Sunday nights are wasted when you give them to Jesus Christ. When you think Wednesday nights are wasted when you give them to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. There's something wrong in your life. And I'm convinced that, the, that a lot of church fo folks are religious, but they're lost as can be. Let me tell you why I'm convinced of that. They have no spiritual appetite. I want to tell you, when a baby, a baby is healthy because it has an appetite. You take a baby, you don't feed that baby for a while, I want to tell you, it'll cry, won't it? Maybe it can't tell you what's wrong, it'll cry. But you put a bottle to that baby's lip, and it'll... Come on. Because it has a desire for milk. And I want to tell you, if you have no spiritual desires in your heart, to honor God and serve God, you're not God's child. It's a spiritual desire in your heart. You want milk. You want strength. You want to grow. You want some meat to get on your body. There's no desire, and there's many people that are lost without God. They're going to go to hell thinking they're going to heaven. Oh, you're here just because of the opportunity that affords you, not because of the Christ you want to honor you. You know what people need? You, you, know, you know what a New Year's resolution does? It keeps you in church one or two weeks. That's about as long as you can make it. Come on. On a resolution. But if you'll get your relationship, I wouldn't have to beg you. Well, I'm going to be there. Come on. It's getting awful quiet. Is it, did it say Mount Pisgah Baptist Church down there? Okay, well, I want to make sure I'm in the right church this morning. But you know I'm telling you the truth. I wouldn't have to beg people and plead with you if you'd just get a relationship with a living God. you say, let's just do it. Let's get it done. It's the Lord we're serving. 
And I want to tell you something. There's a lot, many people here. I'm not being critical. I'm just being honest. I'm just being to the point this morning that, you're, that I've got folks here. I, 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 that I don't, I'm not God. I can't play God. But I tell you what, the Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. There's no spiritual fruit in your life whatsoever. You need to get saved. All right, with God one. Now don't get upset with me. I'm only delivering the paper this morning. Brother Harvey brings me a paper every Sunday morning. I never forget one morning he brought in and said, Tennessee loses. I went over and I beat him up. I said, what are you doing, Harvey, bringing me a paper like that? He didn't print the paper. He only delivered it. I didn't print this. I'm just delivering it. Now you can quit paying the paper boy if you want to, but I'm still going to deliver the paper. Religious but lost. Get your relationship with God that's real, folks. When somebody asks you if you're saved, don't say, yeah, I know because I belong to a church. Hogwash. Because I've been to some baptistry, there's power in the tub. We sing there's power in the blood. We don't sing water fellowship, water joy divine, leaning on the baptistry. We sing water fellowship, water joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Say amen. amen. All right, if you'll help me this year preach, I'll preach. If you don't, I'll do my best preach anyway. Four things. One group, destruction. Mary, show affection and love. Peter, missed the opportunity. Judas, saw an opportunity. He'll just keep on deceiving people. You can too if you want to. Maybe only eternity will show it, but you could get saved if you wanted to. Here's the last thing, or next to the last thing. Jesus used the opportunity to do the will of God. Without reading it, we'll visit the Gethsemane. I was there a few weeks ago. It's believed some of those olive trees are 2,000 years of age because of their longevity of life. Perhaps I was standing near one or next to one where Christ prayed. Not sure. But he went to that to garden to pray and where his blood became as, uh, excuse me, his sweat became as drops of blood from his skin out of his pores of his body. He prayed in earnest and he said, God, he said, not my will. He said, but if, if, it, be, if, it, if it could make this cup pass from me. When Jesus prayed that prayer, it was no distrust toward his father. It wasn't that he didn't believe his father was going to do right. But when he looked in that cup and he saw the drags of sin, he didn't want to have to take of it. You wouldn't have either. When he saw the separation of his father, he saw all the sin of all the world, all of your sin, all the sins of every sodomite, the sins of every murder and adulterer and adulteresses. When he saw that sin and all the payment it would cost, I want to tell you something, salvation is free, but it sure did cost the Son of God a whole lot. Cost him everything he had. Cost him his purity. Separation of the Father. And when he saw that seeing the price of separation and the wholeness becoming hellishness and purity becoming defiled and God becoming a sinner, if some other way, Father, do it, but if not, thy will be done. And the will of God, you listen to what I'm going to tell you, because you need to hear this for this coming year. In the will of God, the Son of God suffered. Did you hear me? I said, in the will of God, the Son of God suffered. Don't you ever disassociate the will of God without suffering to it sometimes. Sometimes people doing the most for God must suffer much. But Jesus overlived, lived an overcoming life because he knew that even when he was denied... He was still in the will of God. Even with the cross he was bearing, he is still in the will of God. When he was accused, he was still, when he was suffering on the cross, he was still in the will of God. He didn't come down. Thank God he didn't come down. He could have saved himself, but if he hadn't been the only one he'd ever saved, but because he stayed there, he's able to save you and I this morning. And he suffered in the will of God. You say, preacher, I've been trying to live right, and I've been trying to do right, and I'm having a hard time. Doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. Does it mean that? It could mean that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. David served his own generation by the will of God. I'm not here at this church because you offered me a call or I wouldn't have come unless you had have. I'm not, I don't stay at this church because I necessarily just love being here, though I've enjoyed these 15 years. They've seemed like they've gone by just like that for me, and I've enjoyed being your pastor and pastoring here as much as any place I've ever preached or pastored. If you gave me an opportunity to preach anywhere in the world, one final time, I'd choose here. I don't care what place it'd be in the world. 
because I enjoy so much just being here in fellowship with, with you people here at this church. But I want to tell you the reason I'm here is because I believe this to be the will of God for me. And if God said to me something different, I'd do my best to get where God wanted me to get. And some of you this year are trying to find God's will for your life. Let me tell you something. You can find it in reading the word of God by praying, seeking God's face. You can find God's will for you. It's in the book. It's not something God wants to keep hid from you. It's in the book. You don't have time to preach about that this morning. You can find it if you want to find it. You found the will of God. Here's the last thing I want to mention. Every one of these people have an opportunity to be saved. I don't have time to read Matthew 27 to you and Matthew 28, but I want to tell you that Pilate had an opportunity to get saved if he wanted to. Pilate looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and after he examined him two times, he said, I find no fault in him. Two times he scrutinized him with questions. He said, I find no fault in him. And Pilate went over after he asked those leaders, what do you want to do? And they said, crucify him. Pilate went over to a wash basin and he began to wash his hands. He said, I'm free from the blood of this innocent man. And I want to tell you, this very hour in hell, he's washing his hands. I'm free. No, you're not. Herod, who was the king who also wanted to see Jesus because he'd heard about him through John the Baptist preaching and he wanted Jesus to come over to his place because he wanted some miracle to be seen. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You say, oh, if Jesus had done a miracle in front of Herod, Herod would have gotten saved. No, I want to tell you, you don't get saved by seeing, you get saved by believing. No, Herod would have not trusted Christ. Did you know, I want to tell you something, here is a man who mocked God all of his life. He stood in the presence of God in the flesh. And when he asked Jesus to do a miracle, listen to me, Jesus didn't say one word to him. Did you hear me? He didn't even grunt at him. Oh, God will just show me something, I'll get saved. I want to tell you, if Calvary wasn't enough, what well, the Son of God did for you at Calvary is not enough, then there's nothing enough to save. Two thieves. They had a chance to be saved. Isn't it strange you can come to church? Two people can be at the same church service and see two different things. We only sang, we sang three choir songs. We didn't sing another one. We got one preacher preaching. But isn't it strange how you can come to church service and some folks say, Oh, that made me mad all night long just getting up there and preaching, preaching, preaching. Some folks go out and say, Boy, that sure did help me. The problem may be your attitude. This is amen, this is old me. Which one do you want? <laughs> Two thieves. Both of them saw him dying. Both of them heard the accusations. Both of them could have gotten saved, but one of them said, Lord, remember when you come to your kingdom, you said, today. So that would be in paradise. Centurion. One of the hardest criminals our hardest person ever to live was a centurion. If you've ever seen Mount of Golgotha where they place where they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, today's a Muslim cemetery on top and you can actually stand back and see the face of the skull. If you've seen pictures of it, you can see the eye sockets and the nose and you can see the mouth. You can actually visualize, you can see it. And it's believed that Christ was crucified on the lower part because the Romans crucified people down where you could actually, people could see what, how bad crucifixion was, trying to keep people from doing other things that caused them not to be crucified. And they'd ride upon the cross while they were there for, and Jesus Christ was there, and it says, this is the Son of God. This is the King of the Jews. This is the King of the Jews, what it says. He says he's the King of the Jews. And that was his accusation that was there, which he was. And that centurion who had watched 10,000, said over 10,000 people were crucified during the Roman area. 10,000 people could have got very hardened over just watching them. Just throw them down. It's just flesh. Just flesh. Nail it, nail it. But when he saw the Son of God die, he looked at him and he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Trusted Christ. Those disciples had an opportunity after the risen Christ had come back from the grave. Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature. That was the opportunity of the greatest events of history. Just like you and I have to spread the gospel to every person. 
while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed now, just for a few minutes. I want to ask you a question this morning. Briefly, but personally. What are you going to do with the greatest opportunity that God's given you? Did you know that your life is very short? It's like a vapor that appears for a little while. It vanishes away. You're like a post, a delivery man comes and goes. Like a ship leaving port and going out of sight across the sea. That's what your life is like. What are you going to do with those moments of history? Those moments of history that God's given you, what are you going to do with them? Are you going to spend your life rejecting Christ, denying, destroying? Are you going to spend your life showing affection and devotion? Are you going to miss the opportunity that God gave you? By the way, I'm glad to tell you that Peter missed it, but he repented later just like you can, and he lived for the Lord. And you can take opportunity this morning to live for God the rest of your days. Are you going to stay religious? Oh, you're religious. Oh, I can talk to you about the Bible. Yeah, preacher. But do, are you sure? Are you 100% sure if you die, you'd go to heaven? Are? Are you in the will of God? Are you serving God where he wants you to with this opportunity? I'm talking to many people in this room that you've not even sought God's will. Just live your life just every day. You've never said, God, what do you want me to do? And if you're here in this building, you're lost without Christ. I won't tell you, he would save you if you'd come to him. Talking to many people this morning, you have a reason with Christ, but you don't have a relationship. You need to get a relationship this morning. You need to know Christ. You need more than a resolve. You need a relationship. Heads are about our eyes are closed. Tell me quickly, raise your hand and say, Pastor. I know that I'm saved. I know Christ lives in my heart. I'm 100% sure if I'd die, if he were to come, I'd go to heaven. Would you raise your hand way up high just for a second? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to trick you or trap you. I'm just going to pray for you. God bless you. I didn't do that to embarrass anybody or trick anybody, but I want to tell you something. You're never going to get saved until you see the need of getting saved. Until someone points out to you, you need to trust Christ and Christ alone. And believe it or not, though I may not sound like I'm your friend, because if I can help you come to know Christ, I've helped you eternally. I may quickly raise a hand and say, Pastor, I've not spent the time I needed to in showing my affection and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've missed some opportunities, Pastor, of serving the Lord. I want to know the will of God for my life. And I want you to pray for me in one of those three areas. Would you raise your hand where I can see it just for a second? Put your hand up. I know I'm saying, those one of those three areas, I want you to pray for me in my life. God bless you. God bless you. And may God help you. And may God strengthen you. This hour, I'm praying for God to give you direction and wisdom. I'm talking to some people across this room. It's going to be very hard for you to do what I'm going to ask you to do. There's some here that you're religious. Oh, you're religious. But you don't know for sure if you died, you go to heaven. You may have made a profession like Daryl did and like I did when, I, when you were young. But you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. I want to tell you something. Nothing is worth going to hell over. And there's nothing in this world worth not having peace in your heart with God over. But you'd raise a hand and say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I die, go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you put your hand where I can see it? I'm not going to come and talk. I'm not going to embarrass you. God bless you. And God bless you. God bless you. And I want to tell you that God loves you. And God wants to help you. And God wants to give you peace in your heart about that. And if you'll come this morning, I promise you. I promise you if you'll come this morning. God will give you peace about that. I wondered for about that in years, folks. Let me, tell you, let me give you a testimony real quick. For years, I wondered about being saved. Made a profession when I was young and wondered about it. It's not until I was 20 some years of age, I come to trust Christ. No, I got saved. I was already in church work, already trying to pastor a church. And I want to tell you something. There's nothing worth going to hell over. You come this morning. Let me help you find that decision. Make that decision with Christ. Some of us raise their hand and say, Pastor. I need to be saved. I don't know for sure I am. Would you pray for me? One last time. Would you pray for me? You couldn't raise your hand a while ago, but you know you're saved. Would you say, Pastor, would you pray for me now? I'm not going to come and talk with you. I'm going to embarrass you. I'm going to pray for you. I've never given a more important invitation than this one. God spoke to my heart yesterday morning, so this is the sermon I want you to preach. I've tried to obey him. 
I believe what I'm saying is true. There's some folks here, you're religious but lost. It's going to be hard for you, but you need to get, to get it behind you. Let's get on with it. Okay, now I don't want anybody looking around. No one's looking around. There were several hands across this building that was raised and said, Pastor, I just don't know for sure if I'm saved. You raised your hand. I, I prayed for you. I'm not going to look back at you, but I want you to look at me. Look up here at, at me just for a second. I'll try to look in your direction. But I want to tell you that God loves you. God wants you to know you're saved. And I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come. And let's get that thing settled this morning. Would you do that? I want Christians to come first. I've not been, I've not been showing the devotion to Christ. I've not sought the will of God to what you're going to be saying. I need to pray about something in my life. I want them to play for us on the instruments. And I want every child of God that's that way. I want you to come. And I want you to ask God to help you. You come pray with these folks that come. So you need to come pray with some folks that come. You need to come on while we're waiting just a second. I want to know God's will for my life. I'll ask him this morning to direct me and give me wisdom. Folks are coming. I want you to come. I want to know God's will about this. God's will about that. I want you to come. I want you to come while we're waiting. Gail, help me here for a second. I want you to come. Be impatient with me. You just wait just a moment. This young man. No better day than day to get it settled in your heart. I'm going to get this issue settled in my heart. It's going to be difficult now if some of you do what I'm going to ask you to do, but you need to do it this morning. I'm talking to some men in this building. I'm talking to some young people. I'm talking to a lady in this building this morning. The Spirit of God spoke to your heart. You're not 100% sincere. If you die, you'd go to heaven. Would you get out of your seat? Would you come right now? Let me take the Word of God and show you how, how you know that. Would you do that? If you raise your hand and said you're not sure, on my right. If you raise your hand, look up here at me for a second. Look up here at me for a second. Now, go embarrass you. Just look at me. God loves you. Would you let me help you? Would you let me help you this morning? That person you're sitting next to, they'll come with you if you'll ask them. Won't you say, if you want to go, I'll go with you? Why waste the opportunity you have? Would you come on? This is the opportunity God's given you. In the middle section, would you look at me? You raise your hand. Look at me. God wants to help you this morning. You know I love you. You know that. You can get it settled. Let me help you. Won't you come? Come out here. Come on right now. While I'm waiting. Just get out of your seat. Come on. I'm encouraging you to do so. I'm encouraging you to do so. Another prize. Not through yet. <clears throat> on my left. On my left. You raise your hand. No, I'm just talking, me and you now. No one else, me and you. Let God help you this morning. Would you do that? Come on. Come on. You need to do it. Come on. Come on right now, would you please? I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise you. But God wants to help you. See, the reason God speaks to your heart is for you to respond to it. Do something about it. Would you please do so? Would you please do so? My goodness, no use to live in doubts. No use to live not knowing. Please let God help you this morning. Come on. Would you do it while we're waiting? Come on. I plead with you. Come on. Come on. In the overflow room, would you come on? Would you come on? Come on. Just don't know about it. Come on. Come on, please. Waiting on you. Come on. Come on. This is an important hour. It's an important decision. Well, it could be one of the greatest ones you ever made. It will be the greatest one you ever made in your life. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Folks, I believe I need to plead a little bit longer. I don't believe God would have spoken to me like he did yesterday morning when I was studying. I'd already had something planned totally different than this. But God said, no, you go this way. I wouldn't step across what God laid in front of me. I wouldn't do it. I'd get it settled. There's some Christians this morning. You need to respond to the will of God in your life. I believe that when a Christian knows the will of God and does not do the will of God like Jonah, hinders what God wants to do. Some of you in this room, you know what God wants you to do. You need to make public you've been saved. Some of you need to get baptized. You need a, a part of this church family. 
And I'm asking you simply to respond to that which the Holy Spirit's already told you about. We're going to stand together, and as we stand, as we sing, you keep on coming while we stand, while we sing. Have thine own way. with me. You know, I don't do this often. But my heart's heavy. When I sense God speaking to somebody and I must do what I feel like I must do. Need to come this hour? I want you to come. Spirit of God made love to your soul. I want you to come. heads are about our eyes are closed. Some folks have come to be a part of our church family. I'm great, grateful for that. Aren't you? Amen. Amen. Some of you need to be part of God's family by a new birth. Ma'am, could I get you to come? Sir, could I get you to respond to the love of God? That want to in your soul is the Holy Spirit of God. Say so you need to come. We're going to sing another verse in just a moment. If you want to trust Christ, I want you to come. If you need to make public what Christ has done, if you've been saved somewhere, you've never made it public, I want you to come. If you need to get baptized this morning or set a time to get baptized, I want you to come. Or if you need to unite with this church family, you ought to do that this hour. I want you to come. I want you to come. No better time to get started on the first, first Sunday of the new year. Let's do it. Let's sing one more verse. If you need to come, somebody have a seat you come. Have thine own way. How we're waiting. Surely. You can be seated, please, if you would. Be seated if you would. We'll be going home here in about seven or eight minutes, something like that. While our heads are about, our eyes are closed now. Go ahead and play just a verse for us, ladies. I want you to do me a favor. This is family month at our church. And three or four times I sense I need to do what I'm going to do now. I want you to, many of you have family members out of church. Either live here locally or they live out of town. But you have some folks that are just out of church. You have many of us not saved that know the Lord Jesus. I want you to do me a favor. I want you, and I want you to do it this morning. Take up one of those voice from the pew cards in the back of the pew or an offering envelope. And I want you to write the name of that person that you've got a burden for. On one of those cards or an offering envelope. I want you to do that. Do it right now. Do it right now. You need to borrow a pen, borrow a pen from somebody beside of you, to the right, to the left of you, behind you, or in front of you. I want you to do that. I want you to write those, that, uh, those names down. No one's looking around. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. 
After you've written that name down, I'm going to ask you to do two or three things. Number one, if you want me or somebody from our church staff to visit that person, it's a visit we can make locally or even a phone call we can make. We'll do both. I want you to put down the name and address of that person on that card you have. I want you to do that. Somebody lost, someone out of church. I want you to put their name and address down. Not going to take us long now. You do this. Then I want you to write your name on that card so I know who we're talking to, who's praying for them, who has a burden for them. I want you to write your name. I ask you to do just a couple more things now. I'm going to pray and try to visit as many of those folks as I can. Brother Price will help me, some other folks will help me on church staff. Try to do that. Going to try to reach them. But I want you to commit to praying for them and witnessing to them and encouraging them as much if, if the Lord let, has, gives you the opportunity to do so. I want you to do something a little bit different this morning. It's family month. We're going to do this. We, we need to be more concerned about folks. You've got to say amen to that, don't you? I want you, if you've got that card filled out, I want you to slip out of your seat while they're playing for us. No one's looking around. I want you to come up here and I want you to lay it on an altar or one of these front seats and sit down or either pray just a few seconds and ask God to speak to their hearts, have an act of faith, and believe in God's going to do something to that family or that person. Would you do that right now? Do it right now while we're waiting. You can either sit, and some of you can't. Some of you are older, you can't do that. You can give me the card afterwards. If you can't make that effort to get out, I understand. Or waiting just a moment. You just pray for a second. Ask God to speak to their hearts. Ask God to give us wisdom to reach them. Speak to them. God help us. You just lay them on the front seat or on the altar here. Pray for a few seconds and you go back to your seat. We'll take them up. We'll do our best to see their, those that we're, can we will contact. Pray for them. Let them know of our concern for them. I'll be praying for them as well. praying you go back to your seat Have Grace Borm that comes this morning. And Grace wants to unite with our church family. You think we can get enough votes to get her in? Somebody want to make a motion? <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Second. Second. All in favor say amen. amen. No one's opposed, of course. Grace just barely made this other couple I'm worried about getting them in. Uh, Reese and Martha Woods. I want to unite with our church family. Say both of them baptized. It's like I Grace. Say, you want, okay, Brother Harvey, would like to have you. Can we get a second? We've got a few seconds. Everybody say amen. amen. All right, we're glad to have you. You know that. Lord, this is your mom and dad, right? I'm surprised I got that good of a vote, aren't you? <laughs> Grandmother, too. I'm just kidding. You can come here and sit with them if you all want to. We're going to shake hands in just a moment and welcome into our church family. I think this is good and appropriate what we're going to do next year just for a few minutes. And uh, by the way, if you want to see me after church, I'll be around. I just feel like I need to say that. We're going to dedicate a baby today. Terry and Rachel Future is going to come up here. This is Jacob. Terry and Rachel, take just a few minutes and tell them uh, about uh, how you got the baby. They got it different than the normal way, so I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> speak right up here. Well, a lot of people ask us how we got a baby so fast from the time we started adopting. My first response is God. Amen. 
We prayed for over four years for God to bless our family with a child. It was a very hard time, and we had Christian parents and brothers and sister-in-laws and family that were very supportive. We had a church family that sent cards, phone calls, just kind words of expression, constantly telling us that you were praying, and that meant so much. It was a very, very hard thing to go through, and I will say if I had it to do over, I wouldn't change a thing. I have grown myself personally with the Lord tremendously. I've learned how to have more faith in God and that I don't get things answered when I want them answered. It's in God's own time. Terry and I struggled a lot through this as a couple, and we too grew stronger. Our marriage is stronger, and we just give God full credit for this child. Amen. We went to our lawyer a year ago in December, and we were with her five months when we were called and told we were selected to get this child. It was the best news I'd heard in a long time. I was still really nervous and frightened because I knew she could change her mind at any given moment. I was allowed to meet with her and go to her doctor visits, and that brought us closer together. She is not a Christian, and I would ask that you all please pray for her and her mother. What she did is the most kind act of selfless love I have ever witnessed in my entire life other than what Jesus did for us. Amen. And I just want to say, please pray for her. Keep her in your prayers and continue for me and Terry praying for us because we really want to make this child God's child and we want to do only God's will with him as we try to raise him. Amen. Terry? Amen. Well, the main thing is I want to thank the Lord for my salvation. Um, thank you for this precious gift he's given us. And I just realized that today God answers prayers. Um, if, if anybody's out there and you've been praying for a long time, don't give up because God answers prayers. And I encourage you to tell it to your fellow believers because I just realized this morning this is the one-year anniversary of the month that we come before you and ask you to pray for us to get a child. And nine months later, the child was born. So a prayer works. Amen. Prayer really works. And we thank you and we praise you for, for all your prayers you've given us. And we give the most of praise to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Is this on? Jacob, you want to say anything? There's one more thing I do want to say. Garvin always wants everybody to name their child after him. And I told the Lord, I said, if you want us to name this child Garvin, make him look like you. But he has more hair than Garvin did, so we, we can't name him after the preacher. <laughs> okay, they want me to bless this baby now. <coughs> Come over here. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this family. I recall those days of weeping, those days of wondering. I'm glad I got to share those days with them because now we share the day of, of uh, thankfulness and of rejoicing. I pray for Jacob. I pray you'll bless his life. Use it to honor Christ. Terry and race of strength and wisdom, and spiritual guidance to raise this child to honor you. Help us to love you. Help our lives to honor you. And thank you for this gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's have the grandparents to stand. All right? Grandparents that stand up here. Okay, grandparents stand up here. Yeah, it was hard on you all too, man. <laughs> All those heirs to the hospital waiting for that baby to be born, all those things. <laughs> all right, that's good. Okay, let me just tell you a couple of things, and then we're going to shake hands and rejoice, and we'll make sure the child gets a New Testament with its name on it and the dedications and all that. We'll give that to you. I've got two X-rated sermons I'm going to preach. I said in Sunday school class this morning, two X-rated movies I was going to show. A little slip of the tongue. Had a whole crowd volunteer to come tonight. <laughs> I'm going to preach tonight on if I were the devil, what I'd do to every man and boy. Next time I'm going to preach on if I was the devil, what I'd do to every woman and girl. You need to hear those messages. They'll help you. They'll either make you mad or glad. So need to come. 7 o'clock. Also, the couple's retreats in the bulletin. The blood drive, please read about that. The last Sunday of the month, we'll tell you about Supper Bowl Sunday. What we do, we'll tell you about that. Let me just tell you who to pray for now. Trish Tidsworth had surgery last week. She's at, out of the hospital the same day, working here at the church, doing a few things uh, last uh, yesterday and here at church this morning. Danny Sherwood, that's uh, 
Judy Thacker's brother, Oak Ridge Hospital, Leland Bowman's still intensive care unit, Aveline Galbraith intensive care unit, Jeremy Duncan at UT Hospital, Tanya Wells is in the Hammond Hospital. Tanya broke her hip. One of our children. Raise your, raise your hand, Tanya. She's one of our children right on our bus. She fell and broke her hip. She's at church this morning. Brought our family with them. It's good to see her. Also, we express our sympathy to, to the Jack Fair family, the home going of Jack Fair, the Chester Brooks family, and the home going of Conda Brooks. It's good to see Chester here this morning. Also, uh, David Bowman's, uh, not only is his father in the intensive care unit, his uncle passed away, his father's brother. Pray for that family. And also, Maggie Mitchell passed away. You'll need to uh, pray for that family. The funeral services are here at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. The choir needs to be here to sing for them. Please be faithful in doing that. And I asked two people, Wayne Owens and Mr. Woods, to forgive me. I forgot to put your name in a bulletin for your birthdays. I forgot that. And I ask you to forgive me for, for not remembering that. Brother Harvey, is going to come take other requests. We're going to pray. And then you come by and shake hands with these. And Brother Keith, that's something he needs to do. I have a card I want to read. First of all, it says, Thank you for the blessing you've been and everything. Give thanks for this will of God in Christ Jesus. In a very special way, my life has been blessed because of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the cards, phone calls, and prayers. God bless you. And this is from Bonnie Raby. Also, yes, yeah, she's in church. Good to see Bonnie here today. Also, uh, this is family month, and I want to make an announcement out in the foyer. You'll find a table, and on the table you will, ha you will see... Uh, family devotional guides, uh, three different family devotional guides, uh, gu devotional guides out there. Uh, the first one is the keys for kids, and I recommend every family, and Pastor Walls recommends every family that has young children to pick up one of the devotional guides, the keys for kids. It'll be a help and a blessing to you. Also, we have um, booklets or devotional guides for the youth out on the table, and I encourage the young people to pick these up, and then for the family. Uh, if you're here and you have a family, I uh, want you to pick up a family devotional guide as well. You can see those out in the foyer. I think they'll be a help and a blessing to you. So please be sure and pick those up. Brother Harvey? Sure will be. Sure will be. They're free. Elmer Long was here this morning. I don't know where he's still in the worship service tonight. He was in Sunday school. Amen. And he's been out for weeks, and we're glad he's doing better. Tomorrow night, the choir will sing from 8, uh, well, 7.45 till 8 o'clock. We have four songs we'll be singing before the funeral, and that will be the choir's participation. So we encourage the, those...